precious name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Wonderful that we could be uh, once again in the Lord's house this evening. I want to continue with this uh, uh, mini-series that we're doing on Biblical Christianity. Uh, we saw a few things that were quite important uh, in the attitude that we have to have if we would be somewhat like the Christians of yesteryear, and in particular, uh, the Christians of the early church. But tonight I'd like us to consider some of the things that they said. Uh, and in particular, I, I want to think about their testimony. Uh, this morning we looked at John the Baptist and we saw that he uh, was a testimony to the, to the light. And of course, uh, we also have uh, a similar responsibility in being a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ as well. So let's just uh, pause for a moment of prayer and commit this time to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be uh, found together in your house tonight. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, that faith indeed uh, is the victory that overcomes the world. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you've uh, called us uh, by your wonderful grace. We thank you, Lord, that you've saved us and you've equipped us so that we might be good and faithful servants of thine. And we just pray tonight that you would encourage our hearts, Father, that we would be uh, the kind of witnesses that we ought to be, each one of us. Uh, our daily given opportunities and I pray Father that you'd help us to use our opportunities for thy glory as we seek to tell a lost and dying world of a Saviour's love for them. So Father help us uh, and give us the courage that we need Lord and the determination to be the kind of Christians that you want us to be. Bless us we pray for we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. You know, we read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, about the gospel armour that has been given to us. And when you think of someone who has armour on, you automatically think, well, you know, they are going to war, don't you? And you think in terms of a battle that has to be fought. And as Christians, we are indeed engaged in a holy warfare, and there is a battle to be fought. We shouldn't think to ourselves that the Christian life uh, should just be one of ease and one of comfort. Uh, we shouldn't be thinking to ourselves, well, how can th this faith that I have in Christ uh, help my life to be somewhat more comfortable? Uh, in fact, at times we need to recognize uh, and even embrace the fact that God hasn't called us to a life of comfort and ease, but a life of being a faithful witness. And alongside that of being a faithful witness will bring its share of uh, trouble and discomfort. We read in the Bible about the Apostles and we read about their faithful testimony. We read about some of the things that they suffered uh, because of their love and their devotion to Christ. But I'd like us to begin tonight not by looking at the Apostles, but to take you to the Old Testament and to the book of Jeremiah. Now, of course, he's not an Apostle, he's a prophet. But I would like to point out some things about Jeremiah and then we'll focus our attention on the example of the Apostles. But if you'd look, if you would, in your Bibles to Jeremiah and chapter number 37. When you read of Jeremiah in the Bible, he is spoken of as being the weeping prophet. And he had much to weep over. He was one that was a faithful servant of, of God, faithfully delivered the message, but the people of God just failed to hear and failed to repent and failed to get right with God and he suffered a great deal because of that. Look if you would at verse 6 and we'll read down to verse 16. Jeremiah uh, 37 and reading from verse number 6. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah saying, Thus saith the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, Thus shalt ye say to the king of Judah, that sent you unto me to inquire of me. Behold Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against the city, and take it and burn it with fire. Thus saith the Lord, deceive not yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For though ye had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remained but wounded men among them, yet 
should they rise up every man in his tent and burn the city with fire. And it came to pass that when the army of the Chaldeans was broken up from, the, from Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. When he was in the gate of Benjamin, the captain of the ward was there, whose name was Erijah, and the son of Shalemiah, the son of Hananiah. And he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. Then said Jeremiah, It is false. I fall not away to the Chaldeans, but he hearkened not to him. So Erijah took Jeremiah, brought him to the princes, wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah and smote him, Put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. When Jeremiah was entered to the dungeon and into the cabins, and Jeremiah had remained there many days. Now, I like you to notice that Jeremiah was just being a faithful prophet, a faithful man of God, faithfully delivering the message, but the, the message wasn't palatable. And they said, well, you know, you, you're confederate with the, the Chaldeans. You, you've thrown your lot with them. That's why you prophesy so against them. He said, no, it's false. This is not the case. But nevertheless, they took him and they shut him up in prison. And there the Bible says that he remained there in prison many days. But his lot doesn't get much better because at, at the first it seemed like it because Verse 17 says that Zedekiah the king sent, took him out, and the king asked him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is. For, said he, thou shalt be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. So he's taken out of prison, and you think, well, at least he's been delivered, and things are looking better for Jeremiah the prophet. But um, I, I really just want to focus on some of the of the sufferings that he's had. So I want you to go to the next chapter, if you would, uh, chapter 38, and look at number 6. Verse number 6, and we'll read down to verse 13. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchi, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the in the dungeon there was no water, but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now when Ebot Melah, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin. Obed Melech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he's like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from them thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah out, uh, Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he died. So Ebed Melech took the men with him, went into the house of the king under the treasury, and took thence old cast clouts old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under the armholes and under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. I like you to notice that Jeremiah's lot was even in spite of the fact that he was a prophet of God, it was no easy situation. Can you imagine being taken out of prison into the courthouse and things look like they're getting better only to be cast into the dungeon? And I don't know if you've ever seen some of the old castles. I saw this at Conway Castle some years ago, but in, in the place where there would be the prison part of the, the castle, in, in one of the towers, you can see where there would have been a, a, a wooden floor and then you can look down below and you, you can just see a pit. And this was where they would uh, put uh, prisoners uh, in days gone by. And they had a diagram of what they thought it would look like, where they would have a, a wooden floor 
and there would be a hole in the floor and they would put the person down and I don't suppose very gently probably throw him down uh, into the into the into the hole and and it would get so bad um, as you can just imagine the the human waste and and everything as the the prisoners piled up uh, one after another that the smell got so bad that the guards would actually close the hole uh, in the floor so there'd be very little ventilation at all it's, it's just an absolute awful type of prison experience there was no sky television in those days it was absolutely awful and I kind of imagine that this was the kind of dungeon that uh, Jeremiah was cast into. And the Bible describes just the, the awful conditions, how that when they cast him into the dungeons, he sunk down into the, the, into the mire. Uh, and he was there for such a time that people thought that he was going to likely die of hunger in that place. And, and it, when it came time where he was going to be finally taken out because of the kindness of, of this Ethiopian speaking up for him, that they let down these rags and they said to him, Jeremiah, put the rags under your armpits and hold on tight and we'll pull you up out of that mire. It's an awful situation, isn't it? And you might think to yourself, well, it must have been a great job to be a prophet in those days. It must have been a cushy job. I, I draw this to your attention tonight because when people have made a stand for God and when people have been faithfully witnessing for him, there was no, uh, humanly speaking, no security that they could expect. They did not expect a, a flowery bed of ease. In fact, it was quite the opposite. They expected the very worst of treatments. And all that Jeremiah did, his only crime was saying, Thus saith the Lord. This is a message that God's told me to give to you. That was his only crime was that he was faithful to the word that God had given him to deliver. And the truth was not popular then, and the truth is no more popular today. People don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear something nice, something that will make them feel better. But when you stand up and you say, or, or even amongst your friends, or, or in a group of people, or even on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and, and you say, thus saith the Lord, and you speak to them about their sin, and you speak to them about the penalty of their sin, and you tell them of, of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who came to die for them, and, and how that he was buried, and, and how that he was resurrected from the dead, and how, how that they need to trust in him, and, and believe on him, and how they need to repent from their sins, and, and become a, a new creature as they are exercising faith in Christ. Listen, this is the truth, but this is not what they want to hear. And that you may not be cast into a dungeon, very likely won't, but it's not a message that they're going to want to hear. And what I want to emphasize tonight is that biblical Christianity has always been true to the message. We've always been a people that have stood by the Word of God, and in spite of what people may say or what people may think of us, we've always sought to testify faithfully what God has given us to say. So I've got a few things I'd like to share with you tonight about biblical Christianity and their testimony, the things that they said. So I have it's more than three points tonight, but we'll go through them quite quickly. And uh, there are a few things that are quite essential if we would be faithful in our witness. The first thing I'll draw to your attention is quite simply that they testified that Jesus was the Son of God. So they didn't say, well, Jesus was a good man, that Jesus was a prophet, that he came to live as our example, they made it quite clear that Jesus was the Son of God. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, uh, the Apostle Peter, he stands up to preach on the day of Pentecost, and in verse 36 he says this, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He wants people to understand that the people, that, that the person that they had taken and rejected and, re and crucified, that this was God. He was God's anointed. He had come to save sinners. Uh, when Paul was saved, uh, he was Saul as he was then known, in Acts chapter 9, the Bible says that after his conversion, in verse 20, that he straightway preached Christ in the synagogues 
that he is the Son of God. And this was an essential message for people to hear. Now, we need to understand that it took some message to testify, some courage, to be upon to testify of that. Now, you know, it's easy for you and I to stand up in church and say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This is, we're amongst friends here. We're amongst families, family, and, and it's quite easy to praise and testify assuredly as to who he is. But it's a different thing to do that outside. Years ago, we had a friend of the family, and he had once said that he, um, he envied my mother and my father because of their faith. He, he knew that they had something that he didn't have. Uh, but he was somewhat of a drunkard, and he loved the bottle more than he would even love him on his own self. And so this paid a, a toll in his life. But every now and then, my dad would speak to him, and my dad would try and witness to him and show him how he could be saved. And he would, he would never, he, he didn't want to recognize that he was a sinner. He always wanted to try and say, well, I'm just like you. I, I, I'm a good person and I can do what you. He would say to my father, I can go to church and I can say that I love God. And my dad said, sure, you can do that. But you wouldn't be willing to do that in your circle of friends. You wouldn't go to work and do that. You wouldn't go to the bar and do that. It's easy to come and testify as to who God is in the church, but quite a different thing in the world. And when we're out in the world, we need to have a bold testimony. Now understand this, that when the, when the apostles testified that Jesus was God, it took a great deal of courage to do that. Because the people that they were telling this were the very people that hated Christ. And that when Jesus said, I am God, when he said that I and my father are one, when he said before Abraham was, I am, that, that they tried to kill him. They said this is blasphemy. And this, this is the same kind of people that Peter was standing up and proclaiming that Jesus Christ is indeed God. And so we need to recognize this morning, this evening, that we need to be quite firm and quite bold in our testimony as to who Jesus is. We need to be uh, a, a people who will nail our colors to the mast and we will make quite clearly known that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he was taken, he lived like a, he, uh, he lived a sinless life. He was a, he was a man that was a prophet, yeah, more than a prophet. He was a man that did good, but the greatest good that he ever could do was that he went to Calvary and he bore the sins of all of humanity in his own body upon the tree. They took him and they crucified him, but he was God and he is God and we need to be faithfully testifying to this truth. But they didn't just say that Jesus was God and they didn't just say that Jesus died upon the cross. They would go on and they would testify also of his resurrection. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says that they had killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. And then again in chapter 4 and verse 33, the Bible says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Their testimony was quite plain. They were showing the Jews that they were culpable in that they delivered Jesus Christ up to be crucified. But the message didn't stop there. They went on to proclaim that the same one that had been crucified had now been risen from the dead. And that in as much as it was an offense to the Jews to hear about Jesus being the Son of God, in as much as it was an offense to hear about his death upon the cross for their sins, it was an offense for them to hear about the resurrection of Christ from the dead as well. And in fact, we live in a day and age where people do not like to hear about the resurrection. It's fine just talking about the resurrection at Easter time. Let's think about the bunnies. Let's think about the Easter eggs. But to focus upon Christ, the one who came and died and, and, and was risen from the dead, well, that's an entirely different matter altogether. And people scoff at it, they mock at it. But this is the truth, and we need to testify of this truth. Look, if you would, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
and verse 21 to 24. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that, are, that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, and to the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The Jews stumbled at the preaching of the cross. Now understand that the preaching of the cross would be termed as the gospel. And the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And they would testify to this truth quite boldly. But it was not a message that was well received. But whether it was well received or not made no difference because it was a message that had to be proclaimed. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a foundational truth to our faith. In fact, our faith in the resurrection of Christ from the dead sets us apart from all other religions. All other religions, well, they point to a, uh, they'll point to a grave where their leader died and was, and was buried, and they can find their bones if they were to look for them. Uh, the resurrection of Christ sets us apart from all other religions. And every now and then, there is a push for there to be an interfaith movement that all the, the leaders, the spiritual leaders in the city need to get together and come and stand on the same platform. Christians standing with the Jews and the Jews next to the Islams, uh, Muslims uh, and get all of those interfaith people together. But I'm dead set against that type of idea because of this one reason is that I would not want to stand uh, in, on a platform, share a platform, uh, represent the Lord Jesus Christ alongside people who do not believe in the resurrection. They do not believe that Jesus died for their sins and was risen from the dead. This interfaith movement that says, well, let's just, let's just try and find our common denominators. Let's just get together. And, and, and where we agree, let's agree. And where we can't agree, let's just try and forget about it. Let's march through the, the streets of Berry and let's have all churches together. Listen, that is something that is anathema. That should not happen because they deny that ch churches in that group uh, and faiths in that group would deny uh, and talk little of and push to one side the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Christ is absolutely foundational. I couldn't imagine the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter getting together with the Jews of the day saying, well, let's walk through the streets of Jerusalem arm in arm and let's make a stand for a particular social injustice. And these are the same people that deny the resurrection. So they made quite a close, uh, quite a clear stand. And then thirdly, I like to notice that they testified that there is healing in his name. Now, before you start to think, well, he's getting all Pentecostal and he's going to talk about how people can be healed and he's going to have a healing crusade through the streets of Berry. I don't want to do that at all. But I do believe that there's healing in the name of Jesus. In the book of Acts chapter 3 again in verse 16, the Bible says, And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now this particular lame beggar that had been healed by Peter and John found that there was healing in the name of Jesus. And this was something that was quite an quite a, quite a important thing that happened and something that was quite significant. And, and I believe that God used them and gave them the ability to heal this lame man because one of the reasons why we had these gifts being given and the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit of God working in such a way was because at that time the church or Christianity was a new thing. It was in its infancy. The Bible had not been given. We had, they, they had no New Testament scriptures at all. And so God empowered certain men with the gift of healing so that it would authenticate this new thing that was happening. 
the, the, the power of healing an individual was what came from God and when the person was healed it was testifying to the fact that God was putting his stamp upon what these men were preaching it authenticated the message but we need to recognize that the gift of healing was a gift but it was a, a temporary gift and so we talk about the, the, the gifts of healing and I'm not speaking about that tonight but the gift of tongues is something that was a, a gift that was given but it was temporary it was to authenticate this new thing that God was doing and it showed people the power of God but these gifts would cease and the matter of healing was a gift that was temporary and it would die uh, die off it, well, it's not perhaps the best word to use for healing but it would it would cease it would come to an end but we need to recognize tonight that God still heals he is still the great physician and he still heals the sick and so when there is someone that is ill what the Bible calls upon us to do is to call for the elders of the church so that they might uh, put their hands upon them and pray for them. Some people have the practice of anointing them with oil. But the fact of the matter is that we're looking to God to uh, have his hand of healing upon that individual. And if it's God's will, that person will be healed. And, and even now, when people are ill, we make it our business as Christians of taking the matter in prayer to God because we believe that God is able still to heal. But the healing that they had was a temporary sign gift. But I'm bringing this up tonight because we as Christians still can testify to the fact that his name is able to heal. And then fourthly, I'd like you to notice that they testified that salvation was only through his name. They didn't say, well, if you want to continue in Judaism, that will be fine. Or if you want to bring your, you know, your philosophical uh, ways in, uh, into Christianity that will be fine if you want to add something to Christianity well we'll try and incorporate they didn't do that at all what they did was quite simply say and this was not popular and it's not popular today they said that the only way that you can be saved is through Jesus Christ now when we say that we are being quite exclusive what we're saying when, when, when we say you can only be saved through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying then that the, a faith like um, Islam is not going to save. We'll be saying someone who's a Hindu is not going to be saved. We're saying that somebody has got some or other faith that they, they've put their, their heart and their soul into. We're saying it will not, it cannot save because Jesus is the only way. Now I understand that this is something that is somewhat unpopular because people don't want to hear that. People say, well, you know, I'm quite sincere in what I believe. And, and you know, I actually do the very best that I can within the bounds of my religion. And you're telling me that this is all in vain? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. And if we would be true witnesses, then we have to say that this is so. Whether someone likes it or not. And the fact of the matter is, and I can well understand, when someone is religious, they don't want to hear this. This is something that is the worst thing they could hear as far as they're concerned. But it's a message that they must hear. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Biblical Christianity has always stood up and said, Jesus is the only way that you can be saved. Your religion won't work, and your good works will never do it. We point people to Christ. And I know that this is a message that really will isolate us. And we're not trying to make enemies. We're not trying to go through life with no friends in this world, but the fact of the matter is, is that our responsibility is to be tr true and faithful to the message that God has given us to give. And so we need to show that Christ is the only way that men can be saved. And then another thing that would be unpopular, but is something that needs to be said, is that they 
testified that Christ is ordained to be judge over all. People have this concept that they're going to stand before God one day and He's going to be their judge. And sometimes in the foolishness they think that God's going to, you know, He's going to make a judgment call based upon how good they were. And perhaps the good works will outweigh the bad. But they fail to recognize that the person that they're going to stand before is indeed God, but they're going to be standing before God the Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is going to be that judge. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 42, the Bible says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. So everybody is going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. All those people that said he's just a good man. Those people that said he's a prophet. That, those people that said, well, he just came as an example. They will stand before this one that they disdained and would not exercise faith in and find that he is their judge. When Paul preached on, on Mars Hill in, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, he said this. He said, he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. Here is the thing, the one that these people of this world has taken and crucified, the one that used his, the people that use his name as a, as a swear word and as a byword, they are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is going to be their judge. Now you tell that to someone today, and they'll say, well, I don't recognize that. I, I, I don't recognize that he's going to be my judge. But that would be just as foolish as, as if someone committed a crime, and they stood in a court of law, and the judge is handing down sentence, and the person stands up and says, I don't recognize you as my judge. Well, the judge will say, well, it makes no difference whether you recognize me or not. You're going to be found guilty and you're going to be taken down below. In fact, years ago, do you remember when, when Saddam Hussein was eventually captured and then they went through a, a trial? And, and you can imagine a man that was the ruler of, of that country and now he's standing in, in, is in the dock and he's being prosecuted for his, his crimes against humanity. One of the things that he had said was, I don't recognize this court. I don't recognize that judge. That's what he said in open court. But they still took him and they, and he was found guilty and they hanged him. So whether a person recognized Christ as being judge makes no difference at all. He is judge. And we need to stand and we need to proclaim this truth. And then another thing that they testified and and, and this is a blessing to us as, as believers, is they testify that all believers are justified from all things. And that word justification is a tremendous blessing to you and I as believers. To recognize that we haven't done anything to bring about our salvation, but God has provided it all. And justification is such where God has taken our sins and He's placed all of those sins upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ paid the penalty for us. And he's taken the righteousness of Christ and he's put that upon you and I. And God looks upon you and I as believers tonight. A people that have been redeemed. A people that are justified. And he doesn't just see us as a people that have been forgiven. He sees us as a people that have never even sinned. And that word justification, like some people would say, he breaks it down just as if I had never sinned. That's how God sees us, as a people that have been uh, justified. And they testified to this truth. In Acts chapter 13, and verse 38 and verse 39. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. 
They were saying the law could never save, the law would not be able to justify you, but and the law, what it did was just show the sinfulness of man, it revealed them as sinners, uh, and the, the Jews didn't like to hear this, of course, they thought it was somewhat blasphemy, but they pointed out the fact that the only way that we could be justified was through what Christ would do for us at Calvary. And Romans 5 verse 1 says to us, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then lastly this evening, I like in the notice that they testified that all believers have the Holy Spirit. And again, this is a blessing to us. <coughs> Look if you would in Acts chapter 22 and verse 38 and verse 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy, Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, the Bible says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man is not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What the Bible is telling us is that when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, is that we receive uh, the Holy Spirit. We've trusted him to save us, and that very moment, that instant when we, we have trusted Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in our lives. You know, as believers, the Bible tells us that our lives need to be lived under the control of God's Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And that word filled has the idea of being controlled by. In the same way that a drunk man is controlled by the liquor, or we use sometimes this kind of language, we would say that man is filled with hate. And you say, well, he's, the hatred that he has is controlling him while the Holy Spirit that lives within us he controls us as well he wants to fill us he wants to control us so that we might be under his control and they testified this wonderful truth that all believers have the Holy Spirit of God if someone says I don't have the Spirit of God well of course then they cannot possibly be a child of God and so these are some of the things that they testified to quite faithfully that Jesus was the Son of God that Jesus was risen from the dead, that there was healing in his name, that there's only salvation through his name, that Jesus is ordained to be the, God, the judge, ordained God of all, and they testify that all believers are justified from all things, and that all believers have the Holy Spirit of God. These are things that they boldly and faithfully proclaim. So biblical Christianity is going to be faithful in its testimony, in the things that we say. So may the Lord encourage us tonight to be faithful to what the Word of God says.